I'm not Matt, it's, that's not, he's ill, so um, I'm replacing his talk. My name is Manuel Bernhard. Yeah. Um, and what I want to talk about is uh, reactive, reactive web applications in particular. Because, you know, how we do things in our industry is we, we take buzzwords, microservices, reactive, and we model our systems using these buzzwords. So that was kind of the inspiration for this talk to use um, this buzzword driven approach. Um, what I want to talk about today is first give a small overview of what are reactive applications, why we have them, what they are, uh, and then I want to build a small reactive web application with you. Um, I don't think we're going to have time for deployment and load testing, but these are not so important anyway, right? Um, but we'll see. Uh, the, the first part is going to be slides, and the second part is going to be live coding. A few words about myself. Uh, I live in Vienna. Um, I, what I do is I work as an independent consultant. I'm helping companies get, getting started with uh, reactive systems, tr uh, transforming their existing systems into reactive systems, all of that. I'm also giving trainings. I'm a Lightband Silver training partner, and so I'm giving trainings for Akka and, and, and Scala. And, um, you can find more about what I'm doing on my website, manuelbernhard.io, and I also love scuba diving. So that's not Vienna, this is not the Danube. I would love it to be the Danube. We don't have turtles in the Danube, that's in Egypt. And so you're going to see a few um, diving related pictures that I took uh, because, you know, it's nice. I also wrote a book, it's called Reactive Web Applications. I have one copy here. Would I have known that I was giving two talks, I would have taken two books, but at some point there will be a question, so pay attention, you can win this book. Um, okay, so let's start. Let's, start, let's get started with reactive web applications, why we have them, what they are. So the first reason why we have them is because software has evolved. Um, in the beginning, we had HTML files because on DOS you only have three letters, so you don't have HTML, and you had GIFs, and you always had the mandatory construction GIF there. Who has worked with this stuff? Um, yeah, these were the good old times because all you had to do was write these things, upload them via FTP and you were set to go, right? Um, then things changed, we got this stack which is fairly popular still nowadays. Who has worked with exactly these technologies down up there? Few people? It, you know, you just MySQL, um, Tomcat with whatever framework you like and then Apache in front. Then a few years passed and we had this new trend coming in. Any ideas what that trend may have mean or may be? No? Yeah, that's later. I think I'm going to give it away because, you know, it's, nobody guesses that. It's the cloud. Um, <clears throat> that's the cloud for you there. Uh, this is, I'm not making this up. This is a, a project I've worked on. This was the thing we wanted to get away from. This is, we discovered this when we started working on this with uh, cron jobs synchronizing data and, and things like that. What you notice is that there's more arrows here, right? We have many arrows here, not that many here, even less there. Uh, so there's more arrows. Now the next big thing, and it was mentioned, next big architectural. Microservices, yes! Lots of arrows, only arrows. Only, uh, only, and they're going to save us, right? That's the, at least that's what we're hoping for. Um, so they're great, they're solving a, a human scaling problem in Teams. Um, I don't know yet if they, change, they solve a technical problem, and I would argue that they don't solve a technical problem, but they create one. But they're changing, they make it possible to scale, like Spotify has a team of 800 engineers. You cannot have that if you have a monolith, right? Um, well, that's microservices. So that's been evolving, and what has happened really is that we have increasing amounts of network I.O., and please keep that in mind. When we, we're like, yes, we have the internet, and we're talking about the internet, and, and we, we have all this data flowing around, what is really happening? I worked at a telco for a, I'm a telco engineer, so I worked at a telco for a while. Um, that's networks for you in real life. There's teams that are working in three times eight hour shift that go and fix the broken networks out there. That's what's happening with telcos. Um, so the question really is, how do we build re reliable, resilient applications on top of that infrastructure there? How do we do that? 
And that's the first reason. The second thing is um, hardware has changed. Here is a Talera Cadium CPU with 72 cores. CPU. It's not a GPU, it's a CPU. This thing has 72 cores. It's already old because now there is a thing with 1,000 cores, hardware cores, with 1,000 hardware threads. It's awesome. Uh, the phones have eight cores by default. The only problem is um, when you have that is this. You have CPU zero that's there, and the other ones are like awkwardly trying to do something but not really doing anything because, um, yeah, you know, we don't give them this. We don't give them this freedom. We, it's hard to get multi-threading right. It's hard, and so we don't do it. You know, when you have more than one thread to, to work, work with, you're already at a loss. So that's, that's one problem we have, uh, and that's our problem as developers, right? We have to tackle that. Um, also, if you think in terms of CPU and operations, you know, up, up there you have like a simple register, uh, register operation that's less than one cycle. But what we're doing, like JPA calls, well, who does JPA calls here? Not so many people. But what you're doing is you're doing a contact, thread context switch, and then you have the costs of that being here, up to, 1 million, um, up to 1 million CPU cycles. It's really expensive. If you're uh, in for performance, you're going to pay it a, a high price when you're context switching. So then, why reactive? Well, distributed systems are the rule. They're, not, they're there to stay, microservices. Um, and then we also have to be careful about what we're doing with our hardware threads. Um, we're lock, when we're locking, we're losing a lot of performance of that. This is, this is where Reactive comes in and tries to teach a new paradigm of, of how to do things. Um, now that I've said why, let's talk a bit about what. Reactive systems are distributed systems by nature. Um, they're a subset of distributed systems that work a bit differently than distributed systems. So now the question where you can win the book, what is the main difference between a distributed system and a non-distributed system? That's, that's, that's the different, yeah, but what's the main thing that's going to change for you in a day-to-day -day life when you're running and operating a distributed system? Synchronization, yeah, you have to do that, but that's not what I'm looking for. The really the painful thing about distributed systems. Communication. Communication, you have to talk, yes, but that's not what, sorry? Network, network? yeah, you're getting there. What happens with the network? Deployment. Sorry? The network is reliable. The network is reliable, you're getting there. What, what's, so what's the main difference when a distributed system? Latency, Latency yeah, but mostly? No, I'm still not there. The failure, yes. Well, you, you're winning. They fail. Distributed systems, they fail all the time, much more often than non distributed systems. So you're getting a book. Um, you know, they fail and they fail in weird ways that, you know, you're like, what just happened? Um, that's the main thing. And in reactive system, failure is a first-class citizen. They're designed from the ground up to acknowledge the fact that they're going to fail. That's the big thing. Um, Joe Armstrong, might have heard of him um, in terms of Erlang. Repeat after me, errors should be handled out of band in a parallel process. They're not part of the main application. That's one of the very important design choices you make when you work with design with uh, reactive systems is you, uh, you don't want to mix your business logic with your failure handling logic or you're going to get really, uh, yeah, you're going to have to do it all the time. This is why, for example, checked exceptions in Java are a horrible, terrible idea when you want to do um, reactive distributed systems. So what we have now are languages, tools, and such for Failure handling, and this involves functional programming um, that we will do with Scala, um, futures, message passing, all of these things I want to show now in live coding. Um, who has seen this? Responsive, reactive. So very quickly to go over it. We want a responsive application which is fast and consistently available. For this we need two things. We want it to be elastic, it can scale in and out. 
dynamically. And the most important thing, it has to be resilient. So when something fails, the whole thing doesn't have to fail. There needs to be a degradation of sorts, but you don't want to go completely offline. Because that's, in, in, in many cases, that's not good. And in order to get all of this done, the idea is to be completely message driven, send asynchronous messages all around, also for failure handling. So, in conclusion, reactive systems are designed for failure and they are distributed and replicated across many nodes. And so if a few nodes can fail, it's not a problem and you can scale up and down when you have more nodes. Now that I've talked for I don't know how many time, um, let's go and do a bit of uh, coding here. What I want to code is something fairly simple. <coughs> okay, so I want to code something that's going to have a view. Um, a controller, they're going to talk via WebSocket. And um, we'll be talking to the Twitter API. And so we have message passing here. We have uh, futures up there in the asynchronous call to Twitter. And we have an actor, which is down there. OK, and we, if we have time, we're also going to talk about the circuit breaker. So um, let's get started. Let me first show you my awesome UI. I managed to make a HTML form which has one input field and one send button. There. Okay. Um, and in code, so that's the, the scaffold of my application. It's a play framework application. I have a controller here. Uh, for the moment, I only have this index method. Um, and uh, in the index, I have, I have my input field here. I have the button here, OK? And um, down there, I have some JavaScript, which is setting up essentially WebSocket and making sure that whatever I send it gets through the WebSocket to the server and, and back um, and displayed. So let's get started with this. Um, and I'm going to get started here and create a few uh, small actor. And um, that's an ACA actor. When I have an actor, what I do, I receive messages. And he here I'm going to just uh, create a first little example. It's a ping pong. Um, so I'm going to log the fact that I received a message. Um, yes. And I'm going to reply to the sender. So before I go any further, let me just introduce actors. Actors are small objects. They're very lightweight. You can have millions of them on one single JVM. Um, they can send and receive messages to each other. They have mailboxes for that. Well, you see down there these addresses below the actors. It's called an actor reference. So it's like a phone number. You never access an actor object directly. You always go through its reference. Okay. Uh, and uh, what we don't see here, but what's really important about actors is they, there's a concept of supervision. Each actor has a parent that's responsible for its failure. They're meant for long-lived asynchronous computation. So uh, in, if I want to set up a WebSocket in the Play framework, there is out-of-the-box support for that. Um, what I need when I want one of these things, I want my channel back out, out being you know, back to the browser. So here, I'm just going to uh, echo back the message that I have here. And um, when I create, when I work with an actor, what I also need is I need a, a, a sort of a serializable constructor. What it, that means is it's called props. So props are, um, they're like, yeah, they're really like a constructor. Um, with the difference that they can be serialized, which is important when you have a NACA cluster and you send these things around and they, they can be instantiated on, in other places. That's why, why you need this, mainly. Um, so here I go, I create my props, I pass in the out as an argument. And then if I want to set it up, the only thing I do in, in play is I go WebSocket.accept with actor. And I have to tell it what kind of, what type do I want to accept and I'm lazy, so I'm not doing XML or JSON. I'm just going to use strings here because I'm very lazy and I don't have much time, but that's going to be fine. We're going to see something anyway, I hope. 
So um, I have my request, the way a WebSocket is initialized, you have a normal HTTP request and you do the upgrade and then you get the socket back. So that's what we're doing here. I have the request, I have the, the WebSocket connection from the server, and now I need to tell Play, please Play Framework, create my actor. Here is the, are the props, this is how you do it. So it's pretty much built in. Um, and what I have to do, I have to tell it where to get this socket. So in the routes file, I just add that here. And then the last thing is um, in my JavaScript code. That's a beautiful thing about play. Everything is type safe. So you go in there and you say application socket get uh, routes application socket web socket URL. And that's going to build the URL for me. So if I change anything, I'm not having a broken reference. So let's see if that works. So I'm reloading here. It's compiling down there. Um, is this readable or is this too dark? Is this OK? The lights are too bright. Can we turn off the lights maybe? There is a light here. I just turned off something here. Okay, awesome. There's a touch screen here, this is great. Um, okay, here is my uh, input field. Let's do something, let's ask them. Yes, here we go, we did a round trip from my browser to the client, to the server. Wow, great, awesome. Um, but that's not really anything very particular to be proud of. What we're going to do next is really, um, we wanna talk to Twitter. Um, and if I want to talk to Twitter, I need OAuth credentials, which I just pulled in here uh, because that's boring to type. I'm not going to bore you with this. So I just have my credentials here, which I fed from the configuration. Okay, and now I want to fetch some data from Twitter. And so what I'm going to do here, instead of replying Pong, I'm going to use the built-in web, uh, um, web service API of the Play Framework. And I'm going to make a request. I'm going to sign this request with an OAuth calculator, um, which requires a key and a token, which I have here because I just pulled them from my configuration. So I just go and I map over that and I take a key and a token. And um, now I have these. What I, want, uh, what I also want is I wanna, um, uh, I wanna add a query string and I'm going to pass in the query string whatever I get uh, as a message through the WebSocket, right? Okay, so through my input field there. And then I do a GET request out of this. And what's this, what this is giving me is, um, is a future of AWS response. And um, what's a future? Let's see what's a future. A future is a it's a box, okay? I mean, most of the things that we work with in Scala are boxes anyway, but it's a box and it may contain either a response of the type that we want, which is the WS response, or it contains nothing, but it keeps the exception and that's important. It doesn't just throw the exception away, it keeps it, but, it, but we can change futures and keep the exception and, and have, it, have the failure propagate. That's really important, that's part of this reactive um, concept of failure handling out of band of the main logic. Okay, so um, also the cool thing, well, it's asynchronous, it doesn't block a thread while the computation finishes. Um, so, and therefore short lived asynchronous computation. You do this, run this once, and then you forget about it, you don't do it again. Okay, so now um, let's run this. Well, wait, if I want to run this, I also need to um, get the response. I'm just going to um, send the body out to whatever I get back from Twitter. So now I compile and this will fail. And it fails because I didn't give uh, what I need if I want to run something on the future. I need a, an an execution context. It's kind of a, it's backed by a thread pool. It's on what, you know, on what what's going to be able to run this thing. Um, 
And we're inside of an actor, which is great because an actor also needs uh, an execution context to run. So an actor has a context and the context has a dispatcher. The dispatcher is the thing that makes the actor tick and it happens to also be an execution context. So I can reuse that one and then I'm ready to query Twitter. So uh, one thing that I always do because there is always something is querying for cats. And usually, well, you get stuff back, um, but you're not seeing anything here because um, it's garbled because it's JSON. So what I'm going to do here, I'm just, I'm just making it a little nicer. I'm not cheating here. What I'm doing is really I just parse the JSON and extract the text so that now if we retry this, um, I get my cats and I get all the Japanese tweets, which I love because usually you always have full of Japanese tweets there with cats. Uh, less kittens, cats are, yes? What did I do? Uh, you blocked actor. Where? Where did I block? I blocked my actor. Yes? We're getting there. But this is not going to block it. It's asynchronous, right? This is a future. It's asynchronous. It's going to continue running in the background. And there's new messages that are going to come in, which can be really tricky if you mix up references. But that's an excellent question. That's the next thing we're going to get to. I'm trying to build up. Yeah? Yes. I, I, I love this because you're basically anticipating the next steps that I'm going to do. So, <laughs> um, I'm, okay, I'm just going to go forward. And um, because, yes, what we didn't do here, what's very bad, is what if Twitter is broken? So let me call Jack and ask him to shut down Twitter. Just for the, no, that's not going to work. Um, but what we can do, we can, at, you, we can sort of make it break by setting a request time out of one millisecond. The day that this works, we will live in a different universe where they manage to really reduce network latency to the maximum. So I'm going to do that now to simulate network failure. Can anyone tell me what's going to happen when I press this button? 500. 500? Nothing. nothing. Yes, nothing, because I send and I look at my shell and, and nothing happens. And why is that? Because this is a future. A future doesn't throw an exception, it keeps it. So now we have to recover, we have to handle the failure, right? So what we can do with a future is we take, um, we recover from it and we can chain these recovery things and we can say which exception we want to deal with. Non-fatal is just a matcher that's going to not catch things that are desperate anyway. I mean, these are virtual machine errors, stack overflow errors, out of memory error. If you get one of these, you're screwed anyway. So there is no sense in trying to recover from that. Um, so you don't, you just use this non-fatal thing. And then when you get them, you're like, ah. So um, what I'm going to do well, I'm going to send my to my um, to my client that something went wrong here. My God! Um, and if I want this to work, I also have to because it expects JSON. Um, only I'm going to do this in a very dirty way. I'm just going to don't do this at home. Uh, and I'm going to say append message. Uh, and it's going to be the event dot data, I think. So if I do this now, and uh, I look for cats, here we go. We have a request timeout. Oh my god. Okay. So failure handling, great. Only I did it wrong because I'm inside of an actor. And if, if I'm inside of an actor, 
I should be using message passing as the main thing that I want to do when I'm inside of an actor, okay? And when I do that, when I want to do that, I use a pipe. And a pipe is a bridge between futures and actors. Uh, it's implemented internally as an anonymous actor. And what happens is the result of your future, the completed future, whether it's failed or succeeded, gets sent to another actor, you know? And that way you could have another actor take care of error handling, failure handling, send it back to the supervisor, what's, what, whatever. Um, since I'm lazy, I mentioned that, I think, and since I don't have much time, we're going to do this and use the same actor, okay? I'm not going to create a second one, but usually you create a second one. Um, so here we go. Um, so first, most important thing when you work with actors, before you do any line of code, take a whiteboard, draw the actor hierarchy, and define a protocol, a message protocol. Um, because even this small task here is going to have a protocol. So the way we would do this is we have a sealed trait, um, whatever, Twitter protocol, or, yeah. Then I have a case class, um, success, success, yeah, whatever, successful response, or I had it called differently. Um, I'm just using this so that my compiler will warn me that's a best practice when you define protocols. Fail response, successful response, I think. Anyway, um, that's going to be my body here. And this is going to be my failure. Here we go. OK. Um, now, instead of sending this out directly to the WebSocket, I'm going to take and map this. Um, and I'm taking the body here, and then here, instead of writing this out, I'm going to go and say failed response and the throwable. Now, why wrong forward references? Yeah, that's because this goes here, right? Okay. So, um, now that I have this, I can use the pipe pattern and I can say, okay, um, I, I have the mapped result here and I can say mapped result pipe to, that's my future, I pipe it to an actor that I want to send it to and, I, and that's going to be myself because as I said, I'm lazy and I'm not creating a second actor. So now I'm receiving the result of the future by the way, if you don't map this into a custom protocol, you will get directly the type of the result that you were expecting if the call succeed. But if it doesn't, you get a weird internal representation that's called, um, well, I forgot how it's called, but it's, it's, uh, it's weird and you don't expect it. So always map these things and, and create your own little definition here. Um, all right, so I think I've done what I needed to. No, I have forgotten to actually deal with the messages when they come in. So, so when there is a successful response, um, what you do is you send it out, okay? And when there is a failed response, you also send it to out. Yeah, so, oops, and here we go. All right, let's see if this still works. Let's reload, cat, send, and I guess this is still starting. Yeah, here we go. Let's see if it works if I remove this or, you know, make this more realistic. Here we go, yes. Oh, isn't that cute? Um, so, that's the pipes. That's how you do with failure handling properly on futures inside of actors. Um, all right, so now let's talk about something different, but still related. 
Um, what if you're interacting with a legacy system, a legacy backend system, and that's something that's extremely frequent. You have this new shiny Acre application, but you have some legacy application that you need to talk to. And you want to protect that from failing, basically. Uh, a great example and use case, uh, use case study, it's uh, Walmart Canada. Kevin Weber did that from Lightband, or used to be from Lightband anyway. And um, he describes the use of circuit breakers. I think there's a webinar or something, you can look it up. Uh, a circuit breaker is like in your home. You know, when you, when you put on the electric oven, the dishwasher, uh, the toaster, and the hairdryer at the same time, and then you hear click, and all the lights go out. This is a circuit breaker. At home, you usually don't have industrial circuit breakers which recover automatically. These exist in, 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 you know, like in this building here, you will have circuit breakers that attempt a reset on their own. Um, but we don't have this at home. So what this thing does is it protects your resource. So for example, this call to Twitter, I will protect Twitter against me clicking too fast on my send button, which of course makes no sense here, but imagine you had something. Um, so you want to prevent cascading failure. So there's three states. It's either closed, then, it, then it's great. It trips, it goes to open. It attempts a reset. And if it feels w well again, it goes back to, to the reset to, uh, to, to the closed state. Since there's not much time left, let's implement this really quickly. So how do I do that really quickly? I take a breaker. I grow all X. Yes, I could do that, but that, would, that wouldn't be a challenge, would it now? Um, scheduler, I need to know about time. Um, fortunately, in ACA, there is a thing called the scheduler that knows about time. I need to know how many failures I'm willing to allow. I'm allowing two failures. Time out of my calls, two seconds. If it's taking longer than two seconds, I'm tripping. Reset timeout. After five seconds, I'm feeling confident again that this works. I talked about seconds. I need to let it know about seconds. Here I go. I know about seconds now. Um, and now, in order to see something, so on open, I go, I go, and I say logger dot error. Open. On half open, that's when I'm getting in the green state. Half open, hang in there. And then on close, I go logger info, closed. Yay. And then I go with a small smiley like this. OK, so now, um, yeah, yeah. I need to escape this guy. Or, you know, since this is Scala, I do a triple quote, then I don't need to escape it. So, um, what I want to do is I want to let things fail, so I'm removing my failure handler here. Because I want it to trip. Second thing I need to do, all these defs, all these vowels, I replace them with defs because I'm going to rerun this every time, okay? Um, and if there were walls, it would always be always the same thing. And then this call to Twitter, this future, I'm going to protect it. So I'm going to take the, uh, uh, this, um, this future and I'm going to wrap it in, in the in the, with the circuit breaker. And then I leave it to pipe back to myself, okay? So um, let's see. What happens? I'm going back down to one second, one millisecond. Restarting this. Cat. One failure, two failures, three failures. And I'm open. And I continue now. And I'm going to be half open, but it's failing again, so I'm again in open state. Okay? So now the question is how can I get it to actually go back in the green state? And the way I'm going to do this is fairly, I'm, I'm going to cheat here, but what I'm going to say is I'm using a var, which is really like, ooh, why am I doing this? Um, and when I'm in half open state, 
I'm resetting the timeout to one second, so that's realistic. So that once we have passed this um, here, I'm going to be back in, in, in a green state. Let's see if that works. Do you understand what I'm doing here? Cheating my, cheating the whole thing to make it work. So, um, uh, cat, one click, two clicks, three clicks. I'm open. And a few more clicks. I'm half opened and I'm closed. And here I go with my cats. Lots of love, everyone. Um, yeah, that's basically it. I have two minutes and 30 seconds to talk about deployment. That's fine. It's not a big deal, right? So my, what I always tell my clients is, um, well, of course, deployment is it really, you don't want to have only one node with the thing. Otherwise, you know, what's the point of being reactive? We just said it's a distributed system. But it's not trivial to build this thing. So don't build, I mean, unless you're a big company, you have a big ops team on lots of resources, don't build your own thing. That's what I'm saying. Most of my clients, you know, use a managed solution. Lightband has this thing called the conductor, which I'm using at a client now. It's pretty awesome. Uh, it uses Docker, but you don't barely notice that there is Docker. You just upload a bundle, build your things, deploy them automatically. It's pretty great. Um, so it's for Akka and Play applications, of course, but also other things. Since there is Docker, you can put anything in there. We're going to put some legacy Python in there. We're even going to put some distributed Postgres in there. It's, it's pretty awesome, this thing. And the, the most awesome thing is this, this part here, the network partition resolution. What happens if part of your cluster here dies? These two nodes die because the cable, someone tri tripped over the cable. Who, how to decide that I'm going to be the part of the cluster that shuts itself down? And, and this uses CRDTs, uh, which are advanced, um, kind of advanced vector clocks, if you will, um, to, to figure out how to shut yourself down, the right one, the, the right way to shut yourself down so that uh, the important stuff keeps up. So that's one way. Um, here we're supposed to be Clever Cloud. Um, Clever Cloud is a, they, they, like you have heard of Heroku, Clever Cloud, they have this fully managed operations idea and what they have and Her Heroku doesn't, they have auto scaling horizontally and vertically. Heroku doesn't have this, you have to pull these things on your own. So what happens here, you define what you want to go to horizontally from five to 20 nodes and the size of the nodes. And then it's going, when load comes in and crashes in, it has some spares that are running off your application. So the first wave is going to be there and then it's going to build up, you know, the horizontal and vertical so that you pay the less amount of money as possible. It's going to create this good algorithm. And then load testing, we're out of time. So no load testing or do you want, you do mind one more minute load testing? Of course. Of course. Okay. Load testing. Gatling is one tool that's written with Akka and Netty. And what you do with Gatling, you first you record what you're doing. You have a proxy here. Um, you put a proxy between yourself, uh, your browser, and, and, and uh, your application. And so it's recording all the clicks. So it's very realistic simulations of what's going on, right? Um, and then you, you create the simulation file and you say, I'm doing nothing for four seconds. I'm ramping up. I'm adding more users, so you can create really diverse and realistic scenarios of how load affects your server. Because what you do with uh, Apache Bench, you know, the AB command, when you run 100 concurrent, that's not realistic. That's never happening. You never have 1,000 people at the exact same time. Well, sometimes when you have many of them, but, but that's, this is much more realistic. There's one problem. It's limited to one machine. So even if you get, get a big, badass AWS instance, you're limited to one machine. So if you really want to load test, you do something. Oh yeah, you get these nice graphs, graphs and you see this application horrendously failed here. Um, and then you see that the guys here are really poor. They have to wait for a, a one second to get the answer. You don't want this. You want something much more concentrated here in terms of response times. So that's, all of that is Gatling giving that. Bees with machine guns. Who has heard of bees with machine guns? No one. Great. I'm going to teach you something that's um, 
that's sort of, and my disclaimer here is, this is only for educational purpose. This is bees with machine guns. This is also bees with machine guns. There is a video about bees being attacked by a small, well, anyway. Um, so what's bees with machine guns? It's a Python script. You give it your AWS keys uh, SSH access. It's pretty scary. Uh, you have to do some configuration, and then you, you set up a swarm of 400 bees, which are going to be 400 AWS micro instances, okay? EC2 micro instances, and you tell it to attack one target. So what happens then is you have essentially a distributed denial of service attack. Um, so I just told you this, don't, you know, don't use it for bad stuff, but um, use it to test your application. I'm actually in the, in the book, uh, in the last chapter, or one of the last chapters, I'm doing this against random.org, which generates random numbers and has an API. Of course, in the book, I'm protecting it with, with a circuit breaker. Um, but while I was writing, I attacked them by accident directly, and um, they wrote me a nice email. Um, Sorry if you're watching this, sorry. Um, and, um, oh, by the way, if you're done with this uh, and you attacked and you, you tested your application, don't forget to call, uh, call off the swarm is one thing, but also to delete all these EC2 instances. I, I, this cost me $150 once because I forgot. I gave a demo and I forgot. Okay, that's mostly it. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Or you can go talk to me because anyway, there is a break now. So thank you.